When Dr. King first came to uh, Iowa, he came on a November 15th day in 1959. Uh, you're well aware that we have been blessed this year uh, that this kind of weather has come to us late. Uh, when he came in 1959 to talk to the NAACP, that was the 50th anniversary, uh, he did not lead the headlines. The weather led the headlines on that day because it was very cold and blustery, not like it is today. So thank you for coming out. Uh, by the time he came uh, for his second and third visits, uh, the organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was in order, there was an office in order, and so I think they wisely picked different times. Uh, what we'll talk about today happened on October the 15th and 16th in 1962. And then when he came to Davenport in 1965, he came in April of, of that year. So this is a presentation about Dr. King coming to Coe and Cornell Colleges. And in, in many ways, this is a, a presentation that gives you a sort of a, a personal insight of, of the people that were welcoming Dr. King and um, in bringing him to Coe and Cornell Colleges. Uh, I was unable to find the history of the event and how the two colleges came together to bring him. Uh, but I imagine it's the way small colleges still work, uh, that you bring the finances together and you reach out to bring people to your campus, you send the letters, you make the calls, and, uh, and sometimes you get lucky. And Cornell and Coe Colleges got very lucky with the Dr. King coming. <coughs> Well, some background about Dr. King so that we see this in a time period, because so much of what we know about Dr. King is the I Have a Dream speech and uh, the uh, Birmingham and perhaps St. Augustine, depending on where you are in the United States, have lived in the United States. Also, the Riverside speech that he had that he did, and then uh, the uh, I, his the drummer instinct, which was near the end of his life. All of those things hadn't happened at this time in 1962. So looking back a little bit, uh, Dr. King was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and if you've been to the uh, to Atlanta, and in the, uh, the block that is now d dedicated to Dr. King with the Dr. King Center and, uh, and the street is Auburn Street. It is affectionately known as Sweet Auburn. So he was born there in, in, um, in 1959. Uh, 1954, he moves to the Dexter, uh, Avenue Baptist Church, and uh, that's also one of the intersections that we have had. We've never met Dr. King, regrettably. Um, I am almost 75, so I, I lived through some of these periods. I was a freshman when he came here to Iowa. I think that you will very quickly pick up that mine is a Southern voice. Uh, and. In, in 1968, the summer of 68, it was, our, uh, it was the end of my first year as a classroom teacher, and we were headed to Muncie, Indiana, and the car broke down in Montgomery, and we, it, it was a highly memorable day because we had turned on a portable radio, and Senator Kennedy's funeral was going on and the train was was passing through the countryside and the comments were being made. And 
after we ate lunch, we looked up at the steps where we were eating lunch and recognized that we were sitting on the steps of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church where Dr. King had first served. Uh, it almost goes without saying that I was headed to a sociology institute and, and Muncie and the topics that summer centered around Dr. King and about race relations in this country. Uh, we were just a short time, uh, just a couple of months before that, he had been assassinated in, in Memphis. So uh, the Southern Christian leadership comes about in 1957. It's largely operating out of Montgomery. But by 1960, Dr. King is moving to Atlanta and he's at Ebenezer Baptist Church where he had served briefly when he was 16 or 17 years old and then was joining his father at Ebenezer Baptist Church because he was so busy in the, in the work at the Civil Rights Movement. The Freedom Riders were 1961. There was also in December of 1961, I lived in, we lived in uh, Pensacola, Florida. So these, these places are all very close to us. And one of those places that was close to us, I was still in high school when I heard about this, was the effort in Albany to desegregate. And <coughs> that effort had not gone well. So Dr. King had spent two weeks in the jail in the summer there of 1961. Um, well, that happened in 1962, 1961, this effort starts. So we're talking the summer before he comes to Iowa uh, about this year-long effort in Albany having failed to desegregate. Dr. King arrives on October the 15th in Cedar Rapids at the airport there. And I want to read a little bit to you about Dr. King arriving because this is probably different than your expectations are, certainly than mine were. In eastern Iowa on October the 15th was a typical autumn day with changing colors, a new school year underway, and farmers harvesting in the fields. That Monday night, as the Cedar Rapids Gazette would report, Martin Luther King of Atlanta, Georgia, a pacifist leader in racial integration, that's their words, had landed at the Cedar Rapids Municipal Airport. Unnoticed by most, he was greeted by members of a Cedar Rapids family Vernon P. Smith and his wife Phoebe and their children. <clears throat> in, in researching the story for CBS television, by the way, this uh, account is in an account that, uh, that happened on, uh, on October the 12th, 2012. Uh, so people are recollecting what happened careful historical records that we would do today uh, were not happening at the time. So this is sort of an oral history that I'm sharing with you. In researching the story for CBS 2 television, that's a CBS for those of us who live in this area, it's KGAN, and the fourth, fourth anniversary of Dr. King's visit, I learned a lot of things that had not been known a century, a half a century ago. Vernon Smith was a civil rights pioneer of his own in Cedar Rapids. The African American was known as the quiet activist, receiving a bachelor's degree from Coe College and compiling, completing a master's degree in organic chemistry at the University of Iowa. After his schooling and married for a year, he was stricken by polio, resulting in complete paralysis of both legs and his right arm, 
with only partial use of his left arm. But that didn't stop him as he spent his career as a biochemist and a toxologist at Cedar Rapids St. Luke's Hospital. Vernon Smith died in 1999 and was always proud that he and his family had met Dr. King. Vernon's widow, 81-year-old Phoebe Smith, that was seven years ago, she was 81 years old, <coughs> has just recently moved with her daughter to Jackson, Mississippi. In a phone interview, she talked of how it came about by accident and how they had become self-appointed greeters to Dr. King in 1962. My husband called me for work that day that Dr. King was to arrive. We need to be all out at the airport early enough because there will be hundreds, maybe thousands of people to greet him. And in order for you and I and the children to have an opportunity to just see him, we'll have to be there on time. When we got there, there were no cars, no police cars, no security. Of course, the security then wasn't, was in that time was not like it is today at airports, but one would expect that there would have been security for Dr. King. Vernon thought that maybe he had the time wrong. We asked a gentleman and he said yes, yes he was coming soon. Are you going to be there to greet him when he comes? And we said, oh no, we heard he was coming. My <laughs> wife and I wanted to see him and especially for our children to see him. Phoebe continues, so the plane landed and the fellow at the airport comes over and says, well, there isn't any, anyone else to greet him, so why don't you and your family go over and greet him when he comes to door? To the door, that's how it's got to be. In her voice 50 years later, you can hear that she is still touched by the event. And it was the most, it was an experience I will never forget in all these years that I've been around. It was simply wonderful. She said that Dr. King spent 15 to 20 minutes with them and their children, Vernon Jr., Deborah, Phoebe Jr., and two-year-old Catherine, who, by the way, now works at the African American Museum of, of Iowa in Cedar Rapids. And the picture here that is on the pedestal, by the way, is uh, we bought that when we were visiting at the Cedar Rapids Museum. I'll tell you more about that picture and the event. Their oldest daughter, Ruby, went to a Girl Scout meeting, and Dr. King said he wanted to meet her too. And she did the next night in the appearance at Co. So Dr. King spoke at Cornell College on Monday night. And he spoke the following evening at Co College the event at, uh, at Cornell was attended by 600 people. The event at Coe College was attended by 1,200 people. The auditorium at Coe sits 1,100 people, so it was an overflow crowd that came. This period of time that we're in, 1962, is a period of fighting for integration uh, across the United States. And least we, uh, we think that this is only a Southern thing. Uh, in his message that Dr. King gave, uh, when he spoke at Coe College, he talked about the segregation in housing uh, 
which I have heard uh, my friends from NAACP, uh, Cedar Rapids speak of as well. It's also, of course, when we're talking about this having relevance to today, it was also uh, the segregation we have in housing right here in Dubuque, Iowa. In the speech, Dr. King was talking about the need for desegregation and this sounds very uh, contemporary to me. I am convinced that men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. And they don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other. And they don't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. So a little bit more from the recollections that have appeared in, in the newspapers in 2012. In his two Eastern Iowa appearances, the future Nobel Peace Prize Winner talked about racial injustice and said if America was to win over newly independent nations in Africa and Asia, it must first solve its own problems of racial discrimination. He said we have seen the walls of racial se segregation gradually crumble. To put it figuratively and in biblical language, we have broken loose from Egyptian slavery, and we have moved through the wilderness of racial segregation, and we now stand on the border of the promised land of integration. There can be no gainsaying of the fact that the system of segregation is on its deathbed today. And the only thing uncertain is how costly the South will make the funeral. This re reveals that we've come a long way since 1896. That's uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, which made segregation legal in this country. He also, also spoke of human progress that comes through tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals who are willing to be co-workers with God. With this hard work, time itself becomes the ally of the primitive sources of irrational emotionalism and social stagnation. And so we must help time and realize that this time is always the right time to do the, the right thing. Well, that's from the uh, Sun Gazette. If you're familiar with the Sun Gazette, it's the Mount Vernon paper uh, where those recollections were. Here's another that appeared in the Gazette, uh, the Cedar Rapids paper. The Des Moines Register has a piece today about Dr. Martin Luther King's November the 11th, 1959 speech in Iowa City. It made me wonder how the Gazette covered it. So I checked the archives. On November the 12th, 1959, the big story was the autumn snowstorm. Roads becoming hazardous, said the blaring headline. There were two Dateline Iowa stories on page one, one about a, which was a survey of 200 University of Iowa students that showed that 25% cheated on their first semester exams. A second was on the U of I researchers trying to figure out how to provide fresh air to the spacemen, fresh air Iowa for the, the spaceship, the headline read. But King's stop made the bottom of page 10 it might have been a paragraph or two, but that was about it. 
Dr. King's speech got a lot more attention when he came to Coe and to Mount Vernon in 1962. When he gave speeches to big crowds at Cornell College in Mount Vernon and at Coe College in Cedar Rapids, his appearance rated a front page piece in the Gazette. A crowd of 600 saw Dr. King speak at Cornell Nye, to his credit, got out of the way and let Dr. King's eloquence drive his story. Powerful stuff to read Dr. King's words. It just gives you goosebumps. King's speech at Coe drew 1,200 people, and the headlines read, Overflow Crowd, Here's King at Coe, and I quoted part of that information to you. Well, prior to uh, this presentation this afternoon, um, we were talking about Dr. King and Dr. King as a person. Uh, well, there are many stories about Dr. King and the uh, Southern Leadership Conference and his relationship with Ralph Abernathy, <laughs> his closest aide. Uh, that afternoon that Dr. King was assassinated, uh, the good fun and humor of Dr. King uh, had been evident when there was a pillow fight uh, among, among the men that afternoon. Uh, so, so we know from that and other recollections that Dr. King was a man of good humor and a man uh, that was very open among the people that he worked with. But, how was he seen uh, within the public community? Well, Reverend Rankin, who was the, uh, the pastor at Cornell, um, had this to say in 1978. I met him in 1962 in Mount Vernon, Iowa. He was not a good planner, two hours late for the appointment and unaware of the location. He was not a commanding presence, short in stature and ungainly in movement. He was not a handsome figure. He was slightly overweight and clothes too small for his body. He was not a congenial person, impatient in conversation and not fully present. He was not a great speaker words lost in his nose and ill-timed gestures. He was not a creative individual, ideas borrowed from others and frequent repetition. He was not a happy character, a wide mournful eyes and lips not made for smiling. But if God appeared anywhere in the 20th century, it was in the form of Martin Luther King, Jr. Amen. Of course, there's more to the story. There's the I Have a Dream speech. There's the... Uh, Hoses in Birmingham that 1963. There's the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. There's Dr. King at the end of the march from Selma saying, uh, how long, not long, and quoting uh, Theodore Parker saying that the uh, arc of justice is long, uh, but it bends toward justice. There's uh, Dr. King moving into an apartment in facing the segregation in Chicago in 1966. There's his 1967 speech uh, where he's speaking against the Vietnam War. Uh, there is a speech that I want to end with in a minute here that he gives in 1968. 
in also um, another speech that he gives in 1968 where he is talking about the Poor People's Campaign uh, and about how America uh, has a system that is set up so that poor people in this country are always paying for and uh, getting the wrong end of the stick in contemporary terms. So what is his message for today? I'd like to read to you and then ask for some responses from you. I'd like to read to you this, this piece that comes from uh, Dr. King's speech. that is called The Drum Major for Justice. It's quite long, so I just want to read the, the final part of it to you. I think that this is a message for today the way it was in February of 1968. I'd like for someone to say that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want to say to you on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And of all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to say, that I want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody, I'll pass it along. If I can cheer someone with a word or song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message the master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Responses from you. Wow. <clears throat> yes. I think you are correct. It is words that we need to relive and rethink today from the times that we're going through. Um, there's a lot of anger and misinformation and we're forgetting about the direction, and I think those words just remind us that we really have an honest and true direction to go through. So thank you for reminding us of that message. Thank you. Someone else? Someone else? <laughs> <laughs> so often, you know, people come to these events with Martin Luther King, and we hear the message, we take away the words, but what do we do with do we speak out when something is wrong? When something is someone is being mistreated, we talk about housing. Our housing issues are atrocious here in our city. But who's speaking out? People know of it. No one says anything. When that comment is made in the workplace, workplace, are you stopping it? When someone is not getting a job because of who, the color of their skin, are we stopping it? That's where we have to take this to. We have to stop being silent because the silence is killing us here. It, I mean killing us to the point we don't talk with one another because someone may be other. We're all other. And the only race we need to see is a human race, and we're in this together. And we got to stand up and stand up, and we got to stop it because we can't wait for everybody else to do it. We have to do it. Now, if you want to know more of what I'm about, go on my Facebook page. My name is Lynn Sutton, or come and join me in the fight. I appreciate the help. Thank you, Lynn. Others?
Thank you, Lynn. I think you've said the final words for today. Thank each of you for coming. Um, and let's go forth in terms of the words we've heard from Dr. King and reinterpreted by members of this group as well. Thank you for speaking out, Catherine. Thank you for speaking out, Lynn. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>